In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reading for this day and the basis for our meditation is a word taken from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 8 to 13, and we read here, So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. The basis for our homily this morning on this, the eve of the eve of the Reformation, is a word from 1 Thessalonians, which we read. So we thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God. And, in it, and indeed, it is at work within you who believe. It takes courage. It takes courage to proclaim the gospel. And in this text for today, we have Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy who came to Thessaloniki or Thessalonica after being shamefully mistreated in Philippi. Elsewhere, in the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul actually describes some of the ways in which he was mistreated during his ministry, and he writes this, I've worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count, at death's door, time after time, I've been flogged five times by the Jews with 39 lashes, beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled by rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times, immersed in the open sea for a night and a day. In hard traveling year in and year out, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends and struggle with foes. I've been risk at risk in the city, at risk in the country, in desert sun and sea of storm, and betrayed by those who are my brothers, and I've known the drudgery of hard labor and of a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, blasted by cold naked to the weather outside." Wow. Today we read in the paper of Christians in countries around the world who must face arrest or even death for daring to proclaim the gospel. But what about us? What about us in the comfort of our America? It seems to me a little different kind of courage is required by those of us who live in countries that celebrate the freedom of expression and respect of religion and the honor and freedom that it brings to the religions that are expressed in our country and countries like ours. But what kind of courage does it take in our context. We often associate courage with the word bravery or even bravado, but courage can take many forms. It strikes me that in this instance, the word courage is much more related to confidence and not bravery. It is confidence, however, that is less about being right than being comfortable with the faith within to express it day in and day out, when we ford rivers, when we find that friends are foes, or when we meet the calamities as Paul meets in life. It is a confidence that allows us not to be defensive when listening or challenged, and to listen to others respectfully when they differ from us. It is a confidence that is not smug, but generous. And no doubt, Paul worked as a tent maker 
in the midst of serving this congregation at Thessaloniki, and that's why he says both night and day, we worked in order that we wouldn't be a burden to you. This confidence translates in a courage, into a courage that enables us to step outside our comfort zone, to risk more than we were willing to risk before, to work alongside people who are new to us, dressed differently than us, who have customs and experiences so much different than us, and to trust that God, who has entrusted the gospel to us, will help us discern what it means to witness in this new context. It seems that this kind of confidence will be evident tomorrow in the lives specifically as we hear about Luther or Melanchthon or others. But our text today makes much of pleasing God rather than humans. As a young immigrant child, and English is my second language, I knew a lot about pleasing those around me. In fact, it gave me special delight when I was singled out as a good child in contrast to the others. Of course, my real interest was in my self-praise that I could garner for myself rather than for God. And this is a good reminder that there's always a slight danger when we set out to please, that it's really, really not just about us, but it's about pleasing others or pleasing our Lord. So what does it mean to please God in the proclamation of the gospel? It means being faithful to the gospel, of course, but more than that, our witness, our actions, they will be uh, what test our hearts. For me, pleasing God means responding to others in the same way that Christ has responded to me. And so it's no accident that the language of Thessalonica, the, the, the second Thessalonians, the chapter two here, describes first of all the care of a nurse and secondly the care of a father in taking care of a child. It also means that we recognize that when, when we speak that we can either bring light to a room or darkness to a room that we can actually bring comfort to people or perhaps close down an avenue to such comfort. That's one of the enduring things I learned from Dr. Benny here this last week here in our celebrations of the anniversary. How exactly do we discern God's activity in our own lives as we share the hope and love and courage that God has placed within us? In contrast, what does it mean to please humans rather than God? Today, pleasing humans is often thought of in terms of allowing or approving the behavior of other people, no matter what it is or what they say. Here Paul writes, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you on how to live and to please God as in fact you're living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Listen to that. We know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified and that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control their own body in a way that is honorable and holy, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And in that matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of his brother or sister. However, in chapter two of Thessalonians, concern is how we carry the word of God and comport ourselves in relationship to those who receive the word of God. Paul, Silas, and Timothy say that on the one hand, they did not flatter the Thessalonians in an attempt to get money for them. Nor, on the other hand, did they seek to be flattered by the Thessalonians in to gain certain praise or privileges. The concern that Paul is raising here is about motive not just about what we hope to accomplish, but that's an honorable thing. There's nothing wrong with gaining satisfaction or pleasure or praise um, as we work with others in this world. So as I come to the conclusion of my message today, I wanna to focus in on one thing. I'm particularly struck that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy share with the Thessalonians not only the gospel of God, but their own selves. Invocation, you might say. This suggests to me that sharing the word of God requires a kind of willingness on our part to be vulnerable, 
not only to share what we know, but to strive to live what we know and to share also our failings and doubts that we've encountered on the way. The images that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy leave us, therefore, is of a nurse tending young children and as of a father. So what have we learned on our journey that would make us trustworthy guides to others? To what degree do we need to let others discover their own paths? And as they do, what gifts of knowledge and faith and insight might return to us as we receive others in the name of Jesus? So here's a story about a faithful nurse. It was in 1981 that I was called at 2.30 in the morning by a nurse at KW Hospital in Southern Ontario. There was a man there dying of bone cancer and all the oncologists and all the neurologists could not control the pain, so they moved him into a private room. They put him into an isolation ward. And at 2.30 in the morning, she couldn't take his screams anymore, and she called the only one she could recognize from the Lutheran hour in our city, and she called me. I hadn't had a lot of hospital training. I was frightened to death to put on the mask and the headgear and the gloves, and the gown, and the things that covered my feet. And as I sat with this man for the first time, not knowing his name, but only that he writhed in pain that was uncontrollable, I sat down and I shared with him a series of psalms, beginning with Psalm 46, God is a very present help in time of trouble. In the days and weeks that followed, that nurse saw something kind of remarkable happen. The man found in the life and in the gospel of Jesus a way to control his pain. He became quieter. The pain eased and ebbed. The doctors of the community began to talk about the man at the end of the hallway. The nurses began to realize that there were gifts that the gospel could give that simple medicine could not. I was changed forever because in her faithfulness to call on the, the power and the nature of God's word in the world, My ministry was able to take down the walls that separate people, especially in times of death or trouble. And she gave me a new love for sharing the gospel among those who are ill. Wow, the man healed my fear of hospitals. Even as he writhed in pain that first time, I remember just grabbing his hand and holding tight. And two people bonded with the gospel as I began to share Jesus with them. So now listen again to the way I concluded to Understand how Jesus himself and in the cross and being our very present help in tribal, the one who himself on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and concluded with words of faith, it is finished. Listen to how I can ask these questions again. What have we learned on our own journeys of faith that would make us trustworthy guides to others? To what degree do we need to let others discover their own paths? This is a genuine Lutheran reformation by grace alone, by faith alone, by the word alone. And as they do, what gifts of knowledge, faith, and insight might be returned to us if we're willing to receive them, like that man, like that nurse, like myself. This is the lesson on the eve of the Reformation that I pray you take with you as you go into the world sharing the life-changing power of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.